Hello, everybody. Welcome to our forum tonight. We're um, just going to take a few minutes to let people into the webinar. We have a lot of people registered tonight, so pleased um, to see so much interest in this question and um, getting informed about our ballot for November 8th. My name is Ann Luther. I'm with the League of Women Voters of Maine, and uh, we're the host tonight. Um, I want to just say a few quick things to our Zoom audience. Uh, the chat is going to be disabled tonight. If you have questions, they will be posed by the moderator, whom I'll introduce in a minute. You can post your questions in the Q&A box on your Zoom function. Um, you may find your, you have a better viewing experience if you put your Zoom on speaker view rather than gallery view. Uh, and I'll leave that to you to figure out. Otherwise, we're really looking forward to the conversation tonight. Um, and let me introduce, oh, timer. So you see a timer box there. That's our tech support. The panelists have been given time slots and we're gonna be timing them and asking them to you know, wrap it up when their time runs out. So that's what the timer box is. I think that's Pam, pretty- can I get you to check the date on that election? Check the date? I think you said the 8th and I think the Tuesday is the 7th. Oh, what did I say? I did, didn't even mean to say the date. The election is November 7th. No question. Oh, yeah. There are eight okay. questions on the ballot. Election is November 7th. Great. Okay, so um, Jen, put up these little, that, that little welcome slide. So we're going to be talking tonight about um, questions three primarily and also question one. These are two of the eight questions on the ballot. Um, if you want more information about the other six questions, um, next slide, Jen. You can find some of that at the League website. There's a little QR code showing here, which will take you to the site with more information on all of the ballot questions. And I think Jill will also give you some pointers about where you can find information on the other ballot questions later. Um, next slide. The two questions we're gonna talk about tonight, primarily question three, we're gonna give most of the time this evening to question three, which you can see on the screen now, it reads as follows. And then question one, we'll just take a minute on question one uh, towards the end of the forum. Jill Goldthwaite will be our moderator tonight. Jill is a political columnist for the Ellsworth American and the Mount Desert Islander. She recently served as a town council member in the town of Bar Harbor. And she's also served several terms, I think you were termed out, I'll say just four terms, as a state senator in the Maine State Legislature. So Jill, thanks for doing this with us tonight. Um, turning it over to you. Thank you. Well, I'm looking forward to learning a lot about these questions as well. And I'd like to introduce our panelists tonight. Uh, we have Lucy Hochschartner, who is with Our Power. She's the Deputy Campaign Manager for Yes on Three. And she's a community organizer and energy justice advocate who has worked to hold utilities accountable across the country. Barbara Alexander is former director of the Consumer Assistance Division of the Maine Public Utilities Commission. Since 1996, she has worked as a consultant and expert witness on utility issues for state and national consumer organizations. And she's speaking for Maine Affordable Energy. And it would be great if as you both begin, you would explain what's our power, what's pine tree power, what's main affordable energy, so we understand, and what your role is in, in those organizations. So Lucy, we're gonna start with you and you have 10 minutes to present your case for question three. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who's here and thank you to Ms. Alexandra and Ms. Goldthwaite. It's so wonderful to be here and to all the organizers. I am really here today and I wanna start with some of the stories that I've heard, I am out talking to Mainers all the time um, who tell me about their current experiences with CMP and Versant. 
I noticed that CMP charged me $40 for delivery, which is just to allow smart energy to pipe the power across the existing lines and $35 for the power I actually used this month. To me, this is just another way to gouge a few extra bucks from the people that are already hard up financially. I'm about to turn 61, I'm on disability and have had four surgeries in the last seven years, two to just keep me out of a scooter chair. This is getting unnerving. Another, I have been battling for the last nine years to get a monthly price so I can afford it, but that first bill was my downfall. Over the years, I tried to pay when I could, but being a disabled veteran who's a single father of a daughter, I struggled. Over the years, there were times where I gave up paying them and hurt us, and so I stopped. And as of today, my power is shut off. I'm on insulin as well, so that has to be in the fridge. So when they shut me off June 12th, three days later, I threw out what little food I had and all my insulin. They don't care about us as people who are struggling year round. I grew up in a very small town on an educational farm and really had my whole life revolving around the seasons. And to me, the biggest piece about question three is the climate aspects as well. Um, and this is me personally. So I've talked to folks all over who have issues with the affordability, who are living on fixed incomes, who have medical issues. Um, and for me as a young person, the most important part of question three is that I don't want to leave the state of our climate in the hands of foreign corporations that are owned by gas companies. And so what we have with question three is an opportunity for a fundamentally different way of operating. But before we get into that, I think it's helpful to see how the system is operating now, the system that allowed stories like the ones I just shared to happen. Um, and I'd love if I could get uh, the slides up. Perfect. So uh, one over. Or do we just have the one slide? Okay, yeah. Um, to the next slide. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so the current system as we have it is investor-owned utilities. That's what they're called. Um, they serve around 75% of Americans. So last year, CMP Inversant made $187 million in profit. Because they're owned by these foreign corporations, that money got sent around the world. While here in Maine, we got 20% rate hikes. We got... Um, 94,000 disconnection notices. So folks who were unable to pay their bills, that's over 10% of customers. And in Versant territory, it was actually 20% of their customers who couldn't afford to keep up with their bills. And this is all happening while we have the most frequent outages of any state in the country. To me, that's a system that's not working. And what has been really interesting to me as I've learned more about utilities is that it actually wasn't set up to work for people. In the very early 1900s, during electrification, we were realizing that the grid had to be a monopoly. It's pretty unique that way. We can't have competing sets of poles and wires. It would be too dangerous. It would be too costly. Generally, when we have things that have to be a monopoly like that, we put them in the public hands. We put them in the hands of the people to get rid of that exploitative profit motive. While this was the Gilded Age, there was huge wealth inequality, and the people who owned the investor-owned utilities were some of the most powerful men in America, and they lobbied for the current system of regulation as it stands today. That system was never set up to protect consumers. It was set up to continue giving, making it look and appear as if the utilities had regulation. So they are allowed to get an 8 to 12% profit for their shareholders on any money their shareholders put into the grid. Um, that's not working well for Mainers. We can go to the next slide. So that's where question three comes in. This is a question. The text is fully here. Do you want to create a new power company governed by an elected board to acquire and operate existing for-profit electricity transmission and distribution facilities in Maine? I say yes. The reason I really want a consumer-owned utility is that we're not going to be able to have a power company that we can trust to be working for us until it's owned by us, the people of Maine. It's going to be a nonprofit called the Pine Tree Power Company. And we can move to the, the next slide. So what are some reasons that folks would support a yes vote on question three? 
I think the biggest one is that piece that it's owned by Mainers so that it's going to be working for Mainers. It's going to be a nonprofit that's an independent consumer-owned utility that brings back local control. CMP and Versant have both been brought by foreign corporations in recent years. CMP is owned by Avangrid, which is owned by Iberdrola, a big Spanish corporation, which itself their main shareholders are the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Qatar, and BlackRock Investors, one of the biggest investment firms in the world. And then Versant is owned by NMAX, which is wholly owned by the city of Calgary. So rates uh, that Versant rate payers pay actually go toward funding the city of Calgary's budget. Um, I've been on the phone with city reporters from Calgary because they, they were shocked to learn this too. Um, Pine Tree Power is also going to keep money on our hands by saving us an average of $367 per year. By moving to this nonprofit model, we're essentially moving from a very high rent to a low cost mortgage. So currently we pay for the grid. We pay CMP and Versant for the use of the grid, but it's essentially as if they are the landlords and we're paying them a profit on top, like renting. Instead, we buy out the grid in a way that saves us money right from the get-go. And that's because we can access very low interest rate bonds. They're called revenue bonds. Um, that rather than paying the 8 to 12% in profit to Versant shareholders, we are instead accessing this very low interest rate revenue bonds, rates of 3 to 6%. That saves us a lot of money. We'll also be able to reduce outages because we'll be investing in the grid rather than shareholder profits. This money that's staying here in Maine can be used to do the kinds of investments we know we need. CMP and Versant aren't incentivized to do this. They are incentivized to big, big capital investments that make money for their shareholders rather than doing some of the smaller things like hardening the lines, investing in workers, tree trimming. Those things are all critical to reducing outages. And when the people dealing with those outages are the ones put in charge, we're going to be able to see that we can do a lot more with those savings. And the last piece is that it's really crucial for meeting Maine's climate goals. This initiative has been endorsed by the Sierra Club, by 350, by Maine Youth for Climate Justice, by Maine Climate Action Now, by many environmental groups. And that's because our current investor-owned utilities, they're owned by gas companies. We see that they've consistently lobbied against climate action at the state legislature. They're huge political actors that throw their money around. And at the same time, particularly in Versant territory, they haven't been willing to connect the renewable energy we need fast enough to meet our current moment. We can go to the next slide. As for what this would actually look like, we have a map on the left here, which is the, the current state of affairs, which is CMP, Versant, and then 10 existing consumer-owned utilities. Those consumer-owned utilities are beloved in Maine. They're doing a great job. Uh, they range from Kennebunk all the way up to Van Buren. With, with a vote yes on question three, we're moving to the green Pine Tree Power Company. The existing consumer-owned utilities stay as they are. Um, they are going to be allowed to continue the great service that they're already providing. We can go to the next slide. So a lot of folks kind of wonder, how does this happen? How do these savings, how do we see these savings? There's two ways of looking at it. One of them is to look at consumer-owned utilities now, which is Maine's mainland consumer-owned utilities here already are having rates that are 52% cheaper than CMP and Versant. These utilities are already providing great savings for their customers. It's a great, um, a great vote of confidence in the consumer-owned model. The other way of looking at it is future projections, economic analysis, and great independent analysis done by Dr. Richard Silkman shows that this saves Mainers $9 billion over 30 years because of that move to an ownership model that I was talking about. Rather than paying 8 to 12% to shareholders, we can access these very low interest rates and own the grid ourselves in a way that actually saves us money right from the get-go. These blue lines are the savings in each year, ranging in like the hundred, hundreds of millions. The green shows how they accumulate over time to $9 billion over 30 years. We can go to the next slide. As for the timeline, what happens is we vote yes and then move into a phase of board elections where we are going to elect the board of the Pine Tree Power Company, all Maine voters. This is really something that 
preserves energy democracy and gives us all a say in our energy future. And then we are going to be able to, those board members appoint experts to serve with them. And then they are going to uh, get a private operations company to run the grid and hire all the existing workers to make it happen. We'll see if you can wrap it up, please. You can come back to yeah, this in that's the it. next five minutes if you need to. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And Barbara, we're looking forward to hearing from you on your perspective on question three. Thank you very much. I am here as a volunteer. Um, I have spoken out against this proposal for over a year. I am not connected in any formal way with the opponents uh, organization, but I have volunteered my service and they have promoted me to speak on behalf of many consumers who are opposed uh, to this proposal. Um, the proponents are well-meaning um, but uh, in many cases, simply uninformed about how electricity rates are currently regulated in this state and have made promises, most all of which are not in the bill. You will be voting for a 15-page bill um, if you vote yes, and the bill does not guarantee any savings does not uh, provide any uh, enforceable means of ensuring lower rates or improved reliability. Um, the, uh, I would like the moderator to put the Versant power um, chart up, uh, uh, please. Yes. It is very important to understand that everyone's frustration and the vulnerable customer's terrible situation with regard to paying their utility bill is well-founded, uh, but will not be impacted by this bill. Uh, the most important rate increases that have occurred have to do with generation supply. Versant Power doesn't own generation. It is purchased in the wholesale market and passed through on a cent per cent basis without any profit to the utility at all. The other parts of the bill that have really increased in recent years are federal transmission charges. This is the regional transmission system regulated by the feds, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and again, has nothing to do with Versant Power. The other big increase in our bill are public uh, subsidies that are mandated by the main legislature, not out-of-state power uh, utilities or boards. Um, these are called in this chart stranded costs. Most of it has to do with subsidies for solar companies to offer you community solar. The one part of your bill that this uh, initiative will impact is the distribution charge, which is one uh, less than one third of the total bill. Um, so I really think we need to keep in mind what we're actually doing here and not what we're um, misleading the consumers uh, to promise. The important part of this process will result in a rate increase in the short run and that is guaranteed. Why is that? We have to pay for the bond to purchase these utilities via eminent domain. The concept of doing that for 20,000 square miles of service territory and almost 700,000 customers is without any precedent in the United States. The public advocate even concludes that this will take anywhere from five to 10 years to accomplish. It will end up in the courts. And guess what? The bill requires that ratepayers will pay for the new board, the staff it hires, the consultants, the um, uh, attorneys, and all the litigation costs to acquire these two utilities who are not for sale will be paid for by ratepayers. And that is before the bond. The bond will vary. I don't have a firm view as to whether it's 9 billion, 10 billion, or 13.5 billion, but it will be a lot of money 
and we have to get the bonds sold on Wall Street and we will pay the principal and interest and that will go into your rates before there is any conceivable impact of the longer term potential cost reductions that are being promised here. So the problem here is not that public power is evil or wrong, it's not. The problem is to get from there to here is very risky. On top of the bond, on top of the litigation costs, we will pay for the operating costs of a new company, the identity and cost of which is unknown. And I can assure you based on my 30 years of experience, in utility regulation, there is no one in Maine qualified to bid under the criteria in the bill itself to conduct this um, operating company um, management approach for both of these utilities. Versant and CMP naturally are being excluded from the opportunity to bid to conduct this operation. Those costs are unknown and the bill clearly requires that that entity make a profit. So the notion that somehow this is a nonprofit exercise is, is a fallacy. So I've added it all up and what you've got is short-term rate increases and we're only affecting a very small part of your total bill. The real issues in this state the ones we ought to be spending our time and money talking about is the $77.19 for standard offer that is purchased in the wholesale market. That is the cause of the unaffordability of our bills right now and needs significant attention. How we do that when our utilities don't own generation is going to be a significant issue in the ongoing um, set of policies. Let me also talk about this notion of Spain. Every cent in your rates for Bangor Hydro, Versant Power, and CMP, every cent is regulated by the state of Maine. There are no unknown um, sets of, of profits going anywhere. The state of Maine has a legislature which sets the policies for the adoption of our regulatory approach to the distribution part of this bill. And the state of Maine has a public utilities commission, which are appointed by the governor and approved by the elected legislators to regulate the profits and the rates for these utilities. There is no secret amount of nastiness going on here. It is all publicly available, it's transparent, and it is regulated. So I really feel that this, however well intended, this entire proposal is not well thought out, has way too many risks for consumers, and is likely to increase your bills at a time when we desperately need to decrease our bills. Now, who has endorsed this bill? I'm sure that the proponents have labeled those groups who have. But let me tell you who has not endorsed this bill. The governor, our democratically elected governor of the state of Maine, many prominent legislators, the unions who will be adversely impacted by this change in ownership have opposed this bill. Um, many businesses have opposed this bill. They pay rates too and they're as concerned as I am about the impact of this. It is a well-intentioned, completely inappropriate and misleading claim to talk about the fact that this will improve our service quality, because guess what? You can't do that without raising rates. So I'm really happy to answer any questions. I'm very pleased to uh, participate and I appreciate the opportunity to provide this important consumer-oriented uh, approach to this issue. Thanks. Thank you so much, Barbara. And thanks to both of you for sticking closely to the time limits. Um, the next uh, phase of the program is each of you will now have five minutes to expand on your remarks, to rebut anything you heard, 
or make any other comments about this proposal you care to. And Lucy, it's up to you now. Thanks so much. And thanks to Ms. Alexander for being here. And I would just like to say that if, you know, if we're going to talk about who is backing each of these different proposals, the yes and the no side, I think it's important to know that Maine Affordable Energy and Maine Energy Progress, uh, while sounding very nice, are both fully funded by the utilities. The opposition and the no side of question three has only two donors, and they've put over $27 million into ads. We're going to get a new number shortly here as the finance reports drop on Thursday but they've put a huge amount of money into misleading Maine voters. And that is unfortunately become, they make a huge profit off of Maine voters. They made $187 million last year and they wanna keep that profit going. This is really a tried and true model. Consumer and utilities both work in Maine where they're providing uh, power with rates that are 52% lower, but it's also worked elsewhere. The entire state of Nebraska has consumer owned or public utilities. They do a great job. They have some of the highest, uh, the, the lowest rates and high, um, lowest rates of outages, highest reliability and lowest rates in the country. And the other thing is that places that have transitioned have seen reductions in their rates from day one. This is not a guaranteed increase in rates. Places like Messina, New York, which voted to uh, move to a consumer-owned utility in the 1980s, immediately saw their rates go down by 24%. This also has union support. The main State Nurses Association just endorsed the yes on question three side last week, and they said that the unions here we're going to be protected they were they were voting and supporting pine tree power both because of their belief that we need to be protecting consumers and in fact their patients over above all else i was talking to a nicu nurse who was talk, telling me about how she sends vulnerable babies home you know every once in a while and she's not sure if their parents have access to to electricity that's a really dangerous situation so they both support it because of their patients and because of their union brothers and sisters we're going to be able to see that they maintain all of their current rights under the new consumer owned utility all of their pensions their jobs and uh, their union employee status and so this is really something that's been endorsed by a broad range of people from all across the aisle. I talked to folks on every end of the political spectrum, legislators, consumers, regular voters, young people who, who aren't consumers yet. And the reason that we really support this is that this is a proposal that above all else puts people first. What we know for certain is that with, a, with an investor-owned utility like CMP and Versant, their only job, their fiduciary responsibility is to their shareholders. Their job is to rip us off and make as much money as possible. It is true that they are regulated, but what's unfortunately happened is that the regulators just can't compete. CMP and Versant were both bought by huge multinational corporations that have many, many lawyers, many, many lobbyists, and a lot more money than the people of Maine will ever have. CMP, for instance, was bought by Iberdrola. They made $2.7 billion in profit in just the first half of this year. We are not able to be effective regulators of companies this large. And in fact, the whole system was set up in order to be not effectively regulated. This was a system of regulation designed in the early 1900s by the owners of the utilities themselves. It was always set up to be working for the utilities over the consumers. And we can try, and I think the people in these offices are working really hard to protect consumers, but we're just not on a level playing field. And that's why we need to be making sure that the consumers are at the center of all the decisions we're making. I'm knocking on doors. I'm talking to them every day. People want pine tree power because that's how they'll know that they'll be able to have a say in their electricity company and that they'll be able to save money right from the beginning. Thank you very much, Lucy. Barbara, you've got five minutes to add other comments, respond to what Lucy has said or whatever. Well, um, let me first uh, say that I'm not funded by any utility or organization. And I bring to this table over 30 years of experience in utility regulation 
as an expert witness for consumers and consumers only in, through, uh, in over 30 states. So I know how utilities are regulated. I understand the difference between the high sounding set of wonderful events that might happen with this bill, with the reality of how rates are set and what it costs to provide essential service to Maine's residential consumers. Second, Nebraska, 60% of its energy is through low cost coal. That is not a model I think the state of Maine needs to look at. The Great Plains of Nebraska are not being compared properly to the most forested state east of the Mississippi, Maine. When the wind blows, the trees fall down, the power goes out, and it takes money and manpower to get it back on. So this is not a magic wand that you can wave and somehow eliminate profit and get better reliability of service. Storm restoration costs are a dollar for dollar impact on our rates. There are no profits in storm restoration in your rates. Another point, 52% um, cheaper by the little consumer owned utilities in the state of Maine. They are basically local um, five man bucket trucks in a small metropolitan area who are served by CMP and Versant's transmission lines that we are paying for. Um, they are allowed to purchase generation. Versant and CMP by law are not. They are allowed to uh, obtain lower cost investments. I totally get it, but that is not an explanation for the dramatic change. If CMP has to guarantee reliability from Jackman to Portland and Versant from Fort Kett to Bangor and down the coast to Goldsboro and Ellsworth, you, you cannot compare the costs involved in maintenance of poles and wires and storm restoration uh, between the, those two sets of entities. It's just not possible. The $9 billion over 30 years, that's not in the bill. Who's going to be responsible if in fact you're wrong about that? Elected politicians are going to be bringing to the table their own agenda. Some of them will want lower rates. Some of them will want subsidies for who they represent when they get funded to uh, conduct their elections uh, and be uh, on the board. Um, you just can't get a free lunch here. It's not possible to promise savings in the short run. Every reasonable person has acknowledged that. I'm very concerned about the lack of any information about who the operating company will be and the profits that company might demand to come into this state and operate utilities who have been taken over by eminent domain by an elected board of politicians. It doesn't sound like a recipe to me for least cost rate making. Um, one example we've got that clearly documents the disaster that has occurred with this approach is Long Island Power Authority. They took over five to 10 years to buy them and they were not even objecting to being bought. Um, they had to hire another public utility from New Jersey to operate their company. And that has been the source of incredible distress and controversy in that uh, service territory. So uh, again, these are, are pie in the sky proposals. They don't reflect the reality of what we've got to do in the state to try to bring our rates and bills down. And I don't think this proposal is going to really do anything but delay the discussion and incur extensive litigation to argue about the entire process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, the last part of the presentations has to do with question one. And everybody I know is saying, what is question one? And does it have something to do with question three or doesn't it? What happens if they both pass or just one does? 
So you've each got five minutes to speak about question one and how it's related to question three. And Lucy, we'll go to you first. Lucy. Yeah, thank you so much. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I was just unmuting myself. Yeah, that's a great question. And the thing is, they are related. We saw that question one was, again, fully funded by the utilities. And this was really a last ditch attempt to protect their business. They was trying to fake people out. So this was put on the ballot in the last minute with a lot of paid signature collectors and shares the same campaign manager as Maine Affordable Energy, also paid by the utilities parent company of CMP, Avangrid. Uh, this doesn't actually really relate to, to question three if they, they both pass. And that's because if they both pass, question three actually nullifies question one. Um, so we're not super concerned about that, um, that voters will not be heard if they if there is a passage of both. Um, and that is really because both questions are enacted on the date that the vote is certified. And therefore, they'll have the same enactment date. And because of the language in question three, section 4007, if they have the same enactment date, there does not need to be an additional vote on borrowing money. So I think it is confusing and it's really a shame that it's been confusing to voters. I think that was the utility company's intent. I think we've seen them try to use every tool in their toolbox, uh, which has ended up being a lot, a lot of money to put toward ads. I think it was funny. I read in the BDN this morning that only a million dollars had gone into the question one proposal, uh, which is a fraction of question three. But these utilities are fighting hard to keep their business. And to me, it's been as a ratepayer, really disappointing to see that the way they've been fighting to keep their business has not been in providing better service or convincing us that staying with them is the way to go. They've been trying to protect their record simply by pouring money into negative and fear-based advertising. That, to me, is not a company that I want to stay with. Thank you, Lucy. All right, Barbara, you've got five minutes to speak to question one and its interaction with question three. Um, I must confess, this is not an issue on which I have a strong view. I was not, um, I'm not an expert on bonds and uh, public uh, participation for bonds. Uh, I don't speak for the coalition on this issue. Um, I think it's common for us to approve bonds in uh, separate election uh, referendums. But beyond that, I can say one thing. This notion that, that the money being spent for any aspect of this campaign has anything to do with the rates you pay is an absolute fallacy. Those utilities are not allowed by law and PUC rule to include these kinds of costs in rates. These are costs being borne by shareholders, obviously, and I'm not there to talk about, I'm not representing them, but any business would fight to keep their authority to conduct business, a, a business that they've been granted a certificate of public convenience and necessity, that they have paid benefits to main consumers as a result of the agreement that they have purchased these businesses. Uh, beyond that, uh, I, I don't have an opinion. But let me say the recent rate cases with both of these utilities raised rates a small amount for the distribution part of the bill, and both of them are now required to meet much stricter reliability and customer service standards with penalties if they do not. The penalties would be borne by shareholders. There will not be any shareholders if Pine Tree Power passes. Any imprudent act, any failure to meet standards, any excess costs incurred by Pine Tree Power will be imposed on ratepayers. There will not be anyone else. And you know what the object and the option is if they don't impose those costs on us? Bankruptcy. There are no shareholders. There are no other people to bear the cost 
of their mistakes, similar to the shareholder fees fines that were imposed on CMP for its now well-known billing errors, that's not going to be possible if Pine Tree Power screws up the software they have to replace and the billing systems they have to operate once they take over these two utilities. So uh, I'm not at all concerned about question one. I don't think that's the important issue. If they both pass, it's going to the courts. That's very clear. More litigation, more costs, more delay, more nonsense that we shouldn't have to pay for. All right, thank you. Um, this has been helpful. And now we're gonna go to some questions submitted by the audience. This is a little challenging to make sure you each get an equal say. And some of them are very specific and some of them are very general. But Barbara, I'm gonna start with you. Is the acquisition of the existing power companies a stock acquisition or an asset acquisition? And it, it, Jill, let me let me just break in for a second and say sure. Jen, Jen is going to give you each three minutes on these questions. Um, so you watch the timer, but you get three minutes each for All each right. question. And I will say that on this, this question is like four parts, um, none of which I am familiar with in terms of the terminology. So uh, we may or may not need um, three minutes on them each, but uh, I'm going to put them out there since since listeners sent them in. So Barbara, sure. back again to the stock acquisition or asset acquisition. It is an acquisition of every piece of property owned by Versant Power and CMP. All the polls. So that would be, if I would assume that would be an asset acquisition. That is exactly correct. Okay. And the and the dispute about what value that has um, will go back and forth and end up in court, as predicted by most reasonable people uh, taking a look at the process here. And the next part of this question, which you may or may not have information about, is what are the current liabilities of those respective companies? Well, uh, once the purchase is made, um, they will purchase all the obligations of the companies. The bill requires the uh, Pine Tree Power to purchase all those obligations. So if there are contracts in place, um, they will have to purchase those mm -hmm. um, and implement them. Um, they have promised in this bill to honor the union contracts for a small period of time. Um, after that, it's negotiable. And you'll have to ask the unions why they viewed that as a, a significant risk to them. Mm -hmm. But they certainly documented in their own views that they oppose this proposal for that reason. Um, so every asset and obligation of the company is at being purchased here. Okay. And would they acquire additional existing companies or just CMP and Versant? Uh, the bill applies only to Central Maine Power Company in Maine. Um, by the way, Avant Grid, the holding company to which CMP is a part, based in Connecticut, um, also owns utilities in New York, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. Um, and what impact that will have on managers in Maine who choose to get out of here and go work for those companies, I cannot tell you, but that seems to be an obvious concern. The Versant Power um, acquisition is consisting of both the old Maine Public Service Territory and the old bank or hydro service territory. Thank you. Uh, Lucy, I'll walk you back through that little set of questions there. You agree that it is an asset acquisition and not a stock acquisition? Correct. Okay. I agree. And as far as current liabilities of the respective companies, do you have any additional information on that? Yeah, what Barbara and uh, said is correct. What we know is that the bill 
ensures that the service continues by making sure that Pine Tree Power honors all the existing obligations. So I get a lot of, you know, I'm out talking to voters every day and, you know, folks who have solar wonder if they get to keep their solar on their rooftops, if that agreement is honored by Pine Tree Power, that's the case. Um, so that all moves over to Pine Tree Power as well. I think what's important to know here is that the assets person and CMP have to report those to the PUC every year they list their own price and their own value as less than half of what they pay to scare us with on the television. All right, thank you very much. And um, I'll take the next question from the Zoom audience. And Lucy, I'll let you take the first shot at this one. Please explain stranded cost and how we'd be able to decrease this piece of the pie. Yes. So as Ms. Alexander was saying, the stranded costs are baked in various different programs. That's largely, it depends on the program, but it's largely a legislative decision. So those are not something that Pine Tree Power is affecting. I think what is crucial here is that even at a time when our our utilities knew that ratepayers were struggling to pay. We had both had sent out 94,000 disconnection notices this spring. They had made over $180 million last year. They asked for 30% rate hikes of the distribution part of the bill, which is the part of the bill they control, and they got 20%. That is not a system that's protecting consumers. I'm talking to these folks who are dealing with disconnections every day, and it's truly a heartbreaking scenario. Uh, I would like to respond to the notion of disconnection notices, please. Um, let me just check. And uh, yes, we got through that whole question with Lucy. Go ahead, Barbara. Well, disconnection notices will be issued by Pine Tree Power for people who don't pay their bills on time. Every utility in the country does that. Um, and the issue correctly then is what happens next? What happens next is people are allowed to negotiate payment plans. What happens next is we have a small but growing low income uh, bill payment assistance program in this state funded by ratepayers, um, in which really um, struggling folks can get a significant uh, reduction in their bills um, uh, as a result of applying for uh, low-income home energy associate um, uh, home energy uh, program at the CAP agency and applying for assistance through Department of Home um, Housing and Human Services, Medicaid, food stamps, all those programs will qualify you for a bill reduction in your electricity bill. CMP and Versant are required by regulations to offer payment plans. They are not allowed to disconnect in the winter. Um, there are many, many consumer protections designed to help people pay these very high bills, most of which is due to the non-regulated uh, generation supply part of this bill. All right, thank you. That takes us to a question from the Zoom audience. And Lucy, I'll give you an opportunity to speak to how would Pine Tree Power deal with people who can't pay their bills, as mentioned at the beginning of the forum? And um, Barbara's just given some comments about that. Can you add yours, please? Yeah, I can definitely add, add mine. The first thing here is that we're seeing savings with Pine Tree Power. And so there'll be fewer people who are dealing with this unfortunate situation of being unable to pay utility bills. I think that's that's piece number one that is important. We should not have a scenario where people cannot afford their bills while shareholders all over the world are making $187 million a year. That is not a situation that works for people like me. I, I don't think that a chairman of Iberdrola's board should be making 13 million euros a year while I'm on the phone with people crying because they are, are going to be disconnected if they can't come up with $600. The second thing is that there are different policies for disconnection notices uh, in different utilities. That's something that the utility can, can work on. And they are required to send them if people are unable to pay their bills, but they can also be working toward better programs for people who can't pay their bills. What we have with CMP and Versant are utilities that their only job is to work for their shareholders. So they are incentivized to be making money for their shareholders. 
What we have with Pine Tree Power is going to be a utility where we're electing the folks in charge. There's going to be someone in the board uh, who has to have expertise with low-income customers. Pine Tree Power can be designing a program for low-income ratepayers across the country. Other utilities do things like um, we are unable to in Maine you can't be disconnected in the winter. There are places that expand that uh, to not disconnecting in very high heat days in the summer with air conditioning issues. There are utilities that have payments uh, as a percentage of your income plans. I've talked to folks struggling to pay their bills and they've, you know, with no prompting said, why, you know, why is it that I have to pay such a huge chunk of my income because I'm living on a fixed income and other people, it's just a fraction. So there are programs for low income rate payers at other utilities that can be doing those kinds of things. To me, when I talk to folks who are dealing with a disconnection notice, I was chatting with some some last week, uh, a woman whose grandson is a type one diabetic, doesn't qualify for CMP as a medical waiver program. It's only three months out of the year. Diabetes obviously doesn't go away. Their insulin needs to be refrigerated. What we can do is have a humane, more humane process um, and a utility that's job is really to be working for customers. And that's why these people support Pine Tree Power. That's why Mainers from across the political spectrum are really looking toward a way that they can have more say in this critical piece of our lives to make sure that we're really looking out for people over the needs of shareholder profits. Let me Thanks. say that every one have, of those Barbara, hang on one, Barbara, hang on, Barbara, Barbara, hang on one second here. There's a kind of a follow on question and you might include your comments in this one. I'll give you first shot at it. Um, this question is, if Pine Tree Power takes over, does the relationship between Pine Tree Power and the PUC remain the same as it is now for Versant, CMP, et cetera? In other words, does a rate increase have to be approved by the PUC? Um, the answer, mm -hmm. the answer is yes. The rates do have to be approved by the PUC, um, uh, and that is why one of my concerns about these promised wonderful things that are going to happen with this politically elected board is not appropriate to rely on because every one of those things will increase your rates and every one of those things will go to the PUC where people will have an opportunity to oppose them, approve them, amend them, or, or, or reject them. Um, every one of those lovely ideas uh, rec recommended for helping low-income people, they're on the table in the state of Maine already. We have a specific program that helps people who need medically needed electricity to get a significant discount on their bill. We have a program that allows the uh, calculation of the assistance to reflect your household income and your usage so that those with the lowest um, income and the highest usage get more assistance than other customers. This is not rocket science. We've been doing this in Maine for years. I was the first person in the state of Maine to help design the programs that are currently in effect for all of these utilities. And guess who opposed them? The consumer owned utilities in this state um, when I was on the staff at the PUC. So um, we really need those programs. They will cost us money. I think we should pay for those programs. They are not a profit center. These utilities respond to public policy by our current elected legislators and our current appointed uh, PUC. And if you think those people are in the pocket of utilities, you haven't been over to the PUC and watched the actual proceedings in which rate cases are being discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next question is one that you um, both made some reference to in your opening comments. It asks about- Jill, uh, Jill yes. I hate to interrupt, but would you let, I don't know if Lucy wanted to answer that PUC oh, question I'm sorry. or not. Thank you, and for reminding me. Uh, and I, Can, some of the questions- uh, Could you repeat are, the question? Well, that's what I'm, some of the questions have vanished and I don't know oh. if they're being removed as I've asked them. So I don't have that question in front of me. 
Anne, I don't know I think, if you do. Yes, that was me. I am very apologetic. Let me see if I it was about the PUC's relationship with Pine Tree Power. Is that correct? If Pine Tree Power takes over, yeah. does the relationship between the new utility and POC remain the same? That was it. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, it does. And I like to, to say that with Pine Tree Power, we have a lot of layers of security that we don't have now. So right now, it's true that PUC regulates CMP and Versant, and they, I, I do think that the people in the PUC are trying to do a good job. The issue is that the, the correct analogy here is not that the PUC is the one that's fighting for main ratepayers. The analogy is that the PUC is essentially set up like a court and you have the investor owned utilities on one side and the public advocates office on the other. That it's an unequal battle between the public advocates office and these huge multinational corporations. We're unable to effectively regulate them. And it's not the PUC's job to be solely fighting for customers. It's the PUC's job to find an equitable solution between the needs of shareholders and the needs of customers. So what's different with Pine Tree Power is that we've removed that profit motivation. Consumers are also the ones electing their own board. So generally, consumer-owned utilities don't even have oversight from the PUC because they are having this their own elected board and without the profit motivation, you don't see the same problems that you see with investor owned utilities. You don't see that need for regulation. But with Pine Tree Power, we've had such issues in the state of Maine with our with our utility companies. Our utility companies are the worst rated, worst customer satisfaction in the country uh, that we said, you know what, for extra confidence, the PUC should actually be able to continue to regulate them the same way that they regulate CMP and Versant. Great. Um, so the next question, which also has to do with uh, costs, and I'll stay with Lucy first on this one and then go to Barbara. I understand uh, that both CMP and Versant make profits, this questioner asks, how much are the profits and from what portion of the pie chart do they derive these profits? You spoke to this a little bit, both of you in your earlier comments, but can you just clarify a little more, where does the profit come in? Yeah, so the utilities are making a profit off of their distribution and delivery. The way utilities make a profit that I think is really interesting and different from how other companies operate. This was really a surprising thing for me to learn when I first learned it, is that utilities and their shareholders make money off of large capital investments into the grid. So anytime the shareholders are investing money in the grid, they get 8 to 12% back. That is why we see utilities often investing in the most costly, biggest kind of infrastructure projects they can, not necessarily the things that are going to give us the best service or the more reliability, things like tree trimming. Um, that's because if you could put in $10 million and get an 8 to 12% return, you know, you could do that. Or you could put if that guaranteed return is there, you could put in a hundred million and get even more money back. That incentive structure is the way investor and utilities work all across the country. And it has caused a huge number of problems. The incentive structure is not set up to be incentivizing those utilities that have good service. That's how CMP and Versant have continued to hike and get rate hikes for their distribution rates, despite having the worst customer satisfaction of any utility in the country that it's not incentive for how we are feeling about their service, the the reliability, which is the most frequent outages, um, or they're, you know, meeting our climate goals. That's not how they're incentivized. Um, so that's where the profit's coming from. It's profits from shareholders from their investments in the grid. Uh, and that's removed with Pine Tree Power. That's the similar reason that having this uh, operations team making a profit is very different uh, with the consumer run model with Pine Free Power. It's a much smaller section of the pie that they make a profit on. The entire estimated cost of the contractor is a fraction of just CMP and Versant's annual profit. Um, and that was done in analysis, both by independent main economists, energy economists who are really fantastic at their work, have a lot of expertise, and also by the London Economics International, which is the consultant that the PUC brought in to study this bill themselves uh, when it was going through the legislature. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Barbara, that question was, how much are CMP and Versant profits? And from what portion of the pie chart do they derive these profits? 
Well, the only part of the bill that we actually regulate in the state, the only part of the bill that Pine Tree Power will um, impact is the distribution set of the bill that I put up on the pie chart uh, earlier for Versant Power. Um, a similar chart exists for CMP. Um, at, Lucy has never been in a rate hearing if she thinks that somehow the issue of what investments are going into rates and who pays for them is not the primary focus of the commission, the commission staff, the public advocate, and the consumers, and the Industrial Energy Consumer Coalition, and all the other um, interveners in the case. They're designed to try to test what is needed and what results will occur if rates are increased. Now, I am perfectly willing to acknowledge that utilities are desiring of earning a reasonable regulated profit margin on their investments. That's not disputed here. The question is, what are we getting for our money? And I know what we're getting for our money. And I have no idea what we're gonna get under Pine Tree Power with a regular uh, elected board, a bunch of politicians who are funded many of, uh, I'll guarantee you special interests will get involved in that process. Why not? It's a wonderful opportunity to push their own agendas. Then we have the unknown cost and the unknown identity of a new operating company the costs of which no one at this time knows, and no one can assure us that we will even have an operating company that is not owned by foreign investors. That is not prohibited by this bill. So I know what we have now. I know how carefully it's being done. I know that service quality standards are part of any rate case, they were part of the recently approved rate increase, and um, we don't know what will happen in the future. So then I say, what are the risks? How can consumers be assured that this proposal will not increase their rates? And I can assure you that it will in the short run, for sure. So, so here's a follow-on question. I'll give it to you first. What happens if Pine Tree Power can't find anyone to serve on the board? And what would the board process look like? Who is the board accountable to? Oh, well, the, the bill sets out in a schedule for conducting elections for the board. Mm -hmm. um, and the um, schedule requires different um, um, sections of Maine to elect uh, their own candidates for the board. Um, I cannot imagine that we will not have candidates, um, whether they're um, paid for by their own pocket or some entity who has an agenda, I cannot tell you. Some of them might choose the clean election fund approach, but they are not required to do so. So once the election occurs, they will appoint the extra members of the board and they have total discretion outside of some very generic categories about uh, finishing out this board with uh, people that the elected politicians appoint. They don't go to the legislature. This is nothing to do with the legislature once this bill passes. Um, so. I fully expect the board to be subscribed. All right, thank you. Um, Lucy, I'll repeat that question. What happens if Pine Tree Power can't find anyone to serve on the board? What would the process look like and who is the board accountable to? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we've seen that a lot of folks have questions about the board and I just want to name that I think this is one of the areas that we've seen both CMP and Versant running a lot of money in advertising right now about the politicians and the big scary politicians that are going to be running your power. Um, that is a total red herring. What we have with right now with CMP and Versant are the two biggest political actors in Maine. We just don't get a say. CMP and Versant have poured 
millions and millions of dollars into our elections, their parent company, through their parent companies. The past couple election cycles, they're often the biggest lobbyists in the state of Maine. Ursent was the, the largest lobbyist this past legislative session. They're just run by boards that we have absolutely no say in. They're run by companies that are also own gas companies. These are not neutral interests. And so I think what we see and what the League of Women Voters really does so well across the state is that it acknowledges that politics and people's opinions are always going to be present. It's who people are. We can instead choose democracy and make sure that we have a say, that we have a say in what's happening. Um, I think what's also important to know is that consumer-owned utilities and these boards, um, there will be candidates. I, I agree with Ms. Alexander here. There's there's no risk that we won't have a board. Uh, the process is, as she mentioned, that there are different regions. Each region will elect a member. That means there's seven elected members. Those seven elected members then appoint six experts to serve with them, experts in climate, utility law, and management. Um, this is a really great way to balance the board between the needs of consumers and also expertise. Boards of consumer-owned utilities are already doing a great job. As I said, there's consumer-owned utilities all across America. This is not a, a new way of providing power. It provides power to 25% of Americans and largely has more reliable and more affordable service and does right here in Maine. Um, so that's what we'll get with our board. Uh, this is going to be a situation where you will get to have a say, uh, but these are not going to be the people who are climbing the lines, we're keeping all the existing line workers and bringing in a private operations team that has expertise in managing the grid. And so there's no risk that the folks you elect um, are going to suddenly wake up one day and have to be the ones fixing your poles and wires. That's not what anybody's talking about. Thank you very much. Um, Barbara, next question. If Versant is owned by the city of Calgary and they would say it's working well, why is it bad for a different local government to own a utility? Surely they must have worked out the issues around accountability cited by Ms. Alexander. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. The approval of who bought Bangor Hydroelectric and Maine Public Service was a public process that happened years ago at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, and that uh, transaction um, was approved um, a, 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 on the grounds that it served the public interest. Um, now, how the city of in Canada benefits from this, I have no idea. That's not an area that I know anything about. All I know is the entire utility in the state of Maine is fully regulated by the state of Maine. And the issue here is, do we want to embark on a risky proposition of changing the situation that will not guarantee any improvement in service quality, any improvement in rates or customer service? And that is my main concern here. All right, uh, Lucy, anything to add on that one? Yeah, I'd love to add just a little bit. Uh, this has been a, a funny story for us on the campaign and that people in the city of Calgary didn't even know that their utility owned Versant. Uh, and it was it was bought by NMAX is the through company, but the city of Calgary is their sole shareholder. So their relationship, the reason they want to keep it is that the city of Calgary gets dividends from Versant. So when you pay your electric bill, those profits go into the city of Calgary's budget. This is funding a government, just not ours. It's funding the, the community of Calgary. It's really, a, I think the piece here is that it's frustrating to see that our utilities are spending millions and millions of dollars telling us that we can't have government owned power, which Pine Tree Power is not, it's a consumer owned utility, but that they're trying to mislead us when in fact they are owned by foreign governments. It's really just uh, been clear to me to see that the utilities have 
really put the needs of their shareholders over in the needs of consumers. They've put misinformation and money pouring into our elections above practically all else. And we are not going to see a utility that protects the future of the consumers of Maine, that protects the future of people like me who are uh, you know, young and depending on the climate of the future, that is that is all not going to be protected unless we have a utility that we can trust. And that's going to be a utility whose job it is to work for the consumers. And the mandates of the Pine Tree Power Company are to be working toward meeting Maine's climate and clean energy goals, toward making more affordable power, toward developing programs for low-income rate payers, toward enhancing um, broadband. These are all things that will be working for the state of Maine rather than the needs of shareholders all over the world. All right, the next question is quite a specific one and uh, refers to the Stafford Act, about which I know zero. And if you are in the same predicament, just let me know and I'll move on. But the question says, would Pine Tree Power, nonprofit consumer, pardon me, customer owned utility qualify for funding and grants under the Stafford Act? If it would qualify, what would be the implications and benefits? Are you familiar with the Stafford Act, Lucy? Yes. So okay. is this going to me first? Sure. Okay. Um, so what I think they are referring to is, is federal disaster assistance and consumer and utilities, yes, are uh, able to access federal disaster assistance. So when... We have, you know, the hurricane was maybe uh, not quite as much of a hurricane as some were envisioning, but when we have a big storm, a nor'easter, a hurricane, a federal disaster, um, investor-owned utilities have to pass all of those costs on. What consumer-owned utilities can do is also apply for disaster assistance. And so when we have these um, situations, we're able to access those funds. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, any well, comments first of all, this is not a consumer-owned utility. The Maine Supreme Court said it was not. Second, it is not a nonprofit. You They're mean Pine Tree Power is not a consumer-owned company? Um, the Stafford Act may or may not apply, but the point I'm making is that these utilities have insurance programs, and they do get federal assistance from time to time, which offsets the cost of storm restoration to its customers. Um, and uh, I, I just, this notion that we're not dealing with a profit-making entity is wrong. Um, it's a politically elected board with a profit-making operating company in charge of it. All right, thank you so much. Um, a next question, and we're getting on toward, this might be next to last, uh, this person asks about the influence of special interest in the election or function of the new board. Who and what might these entities be? That's a lot of speculation there. And what negative or positive influence could they potentially wield? Barbara, want to try that one? Well, that's another risk. We don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't predict bad things, but I'm really good at suggesting that we recognize the unknowns and the risk factors in this entire proposal. We do not know who will want to be on the board. We do not know who will fund them. We had an excellent experience about this very matter when um, the natural gas generators in New England funded the campaign to stop the Hydro-Quebec power line coming through Maine. Why did they fund that? because they don't want low cost hydro offsetting their profits to generate um, uh, natural gas power from their existing facilities. So I do not know what will happen, but I think it's a risk and people should consider that. Thank you. Um, Lucy, uh, the question is the fear of influence of special interest in the election action or function of the new board and who might those special interests be? Yeah, I have to say that this is the question that, that always surprises me most. And it truly is, I think if 
if the worry is that special interests have captured or will capture our electricity system, all one needs to do is look at what's happening now. CMP and Versant are both owned by massive multinational corporations that also own gas companies that are some of the largest political donors in Maine. We have very little accountability. If I want to know, you know, one of the things that in my job I've been doing is looking at all of the ads that they're running. Just recently, both Central Maine Power and Versant Power started running their own advertising separate from the campaign, just about all the good things they're doing. I'm sure entirely unrelated. Uh, they've never run ads before. I'd love to know how much money they're spending on those ads. Those ads don't have the same, uh, the same rules that the political ads do for reporting. And so there's no way I can find out. With Pine Tree Power, what we have is a utility that is going to have total uh, freedom, be subject to freedom of access laws. So we're going to have public board meetings. We are going to have the chance to elect the representatives. We're going to have the chance to vote out the representatives if they're not doing a good job. Those representatives are going to be subject to a bill and the mandates in the bill to be working toward meeting Maine's clean energy goals, providing affordable power, increasing reliability. Those are all mandates beyond what CMP and Versant have to do. Uh, we try and regulate them to do other things, but that's not in their job description for their shareholders. Their job for their shareholders is to make money. And all the while, it's going to be owned by the people of Maine. So the special interest that's really being represented is all of us as consumers. The, the special interests that are being represented now by CMP and Versant are very opaque. These board meetings are closed. By and large, they're not happening in Maine. And we don't know who's making the decisions. We don't know how those decisions are being made. And I'm really encouraged by all of the public access that we are going to be able to have with Pine Tree Power. I know as someone looking to my future, looking to the kinds of electricity that we're going to be using, how we're connecting clean energy, even the rates that I'm going to pay, I'm looking to save money for, the, for my future. I'm looking forward to being able to doing that with a utility like Pine Tree Power that I know whose job is to work for me. And if they're not, I'm going to be able to figure out what's happening and know who to call and where those points of influence are. Thank you very much. Um, Barbara, last question. How can the state of Virginia charge 12 cents a kilowatt hour while Versant charges 32 cents a kilowatt sorry, hour? Sorry, Jill, I hate to butt in again, but did, did Barbara get a chance to answer the special interest question if she, uh, if she wanted I to? I she did. Did she did? Okay, sorry. I should have shut sure. up. Sure, that's fine. Proceed. All right. I need somebody to keep me on track here. Um, so Barbara, how can Virginia charge 12 cents a kilowatt hour while Versant charges 32 cents a kilowatt hour? Um, I have no idea what Virginia charges, and I don't know what part of the bill um, is being uh, referenced here. All I can tell you is that the cost of electricity in New England is much higher than it is in a state like Virginia, which has multiple millions of consumers over which to spread their costs. You know, part of the problem here is we don't really have 700,000 customers. They have a couple million in Massachusetts. We have where the Vermont and Maine are the smallest two of the New England states. And every mandate we impose on CMP and Versant through laws and regulations right here in Maine result in higher bills okay. because the only thing we have control over is that distribution and what Ver um, uh, Versant calls stranded costs, which are the legislative mandates imposed on the utilities by our main elected politicians at the legislature. So we have complete control about our public policies here. How much reliability do you want? Go ahead and set a standard, impose the costs on rates, and we will get the required reliability of service. They are obligated by law in Maine to provide low income programs, and they do. They are obligated by law to connect solar um, installations in their service territory. And based on engineering standards, they do. Um, they are required by law to provide affordable service based on rates that are approved by the commission, and they do. 
yes, there is a profit built into that process. They have to go to Wall Street and get money. So will Pine Tree Power. The people who buy the bonds that we have to issue, the people who invest in future investments are all going to be out of state um, actors. That is the nature of funding our significant investments through rates. But the notion that this is all being done for shareholders is a complete fallacy. They are built into the process by law, but that's not the dominating factor at the Maine Public Utilities Commission. Thank you very much. Um, Lucy, any comments on that um, rate disparity in Virginia? So not much to go on in terms of the question, but. Yeah, you know I will say, I don't know a ton about the rates in Virginia, but what I will say is that I think the better comparison is how is Eastern Maine Electric Cooperative, which serves just as rural of an area in Maine as Versant. They're right next to each other provide rates at a lower distribution cost than Versant. They have miles and miles of lines. They have fewer customers per line than um, a utility like CMP, and they are providing rates at a huge discount. And they're doing it with huge customer satisfaction. I was on the phone with a woman the other day. She's in her 80s. She has a camp that's served by Eastern Maine Electric Cooperative. She lives in assisted living served by Versant. Her opinions of the two utilities, just completely different. She really felt that Eastern Maine Electric was concerned for her as a ratepayer because she was an owner. Every year they have a picnic for the ratepayers, for the customers. It's really a community institution. And that's what we've lost with CMP and Versant. These are utilities who, yes, we try and regulate them to do different things, but their owners are shareholders who do not live in Maine. And their job and their interest is not in providing good or reliable service to us here in Maine. We can try to regulate them to do things differently, but that is not in their interest. What's different about the consumer-owned model is that we're putting the people in charge, we're making owners the people whose interest it is to improve the service. That's why we're able to see these advances across the country with consumer-owned utilities. And that other piece that's really important to these costs is yes, we need to invest money into our grid. What's totally different with a consumer-owned utility is all of those investments come at far lower interest rates. That's something that people on all sides of the aisle looking at this issue agree on. All you know, Whether folks are with Maine Affordable Energy or us, what we can agree on is that investor-owned utilities across the country, their shareholders get 8 to 12% returns on the money that they put into the grid. Consumer-owned utilities access revenue bonds because the source of uh, their future revenues are so guaranteed that they can borrow at these very low interest rates of three to 6%. That, that saves us money. If you were buying a house or if you were making an investment, what kind of interest rate would you want? And I think most folks also want to buy and own that home. It's in your interest. It's, it makes economic sense. I'm a renter. I want to be an owner. I want the same thing for my power company. Thank you very much. And our deepest thanks to both Barbara Alexander and Lucy Huckshartner for joining us tonight and helping us understand some really complicated questions. Um, many thanks also to Ann Luther, the League of Women Voters, and Jen for her unfailing tech support. Um, thanks to the League for all they do to keep our citizens informed. A quick couple of references on sources of help. I assume that people who zoomed into this are probably all registered to vote. So uh, if you're not, the Secretary of State's office has all the information on how to do that. There is a citizen's guide to the referendum election online in the Secretary of State's office. It presents the ballot question, the explanation, a summary, and best of all, a section called intent and content that explains uh, what the question is about and what the principles involved are. I find it extremely helpful. The referendum process itself is available online in a document called Road to the Referendum. It's a brief graphic layout of how a referendum comes to be. And finally, the main office of the public advocate has written a public paper specifically on mostly on question three, just like tonight, but a little bit on question one as well. It's called an overview of the Public Power Initiative, and it is also online. 
So my thanks to all. Anne, anything else you want to add? Uh, no. Nope. Just adding my thanks to yours, Jill, to both Barbara and Lucy for participating tonight. It was really informative. We had um, over 60 people online tonight, mm -hmm. and um, the video archive of this will be posted by Jen immediately after. So check the league's website if you want to um, get that link and share it with other people. Thanks again to everyone tonight. Good night. Good night. Thank you.